Hey done, folks, part one, Brandywine, GMT's game, Great Battles of the American Revolution. I am stoked to finally get into this. I did an introduction video, I believe it was last week, and you might want to check that out. I also did a video that's an introduction to the rules, basically how the counters are read, what do the stats mean, how, does, how do you shoot, resolve close combat, uh, that kind of stuff I covered already, and I will put links in the description to those videos. Uh, maybe it'll help out understanding what is going on and understanding the game system itself. But in this case, this is going to be a replay that I'm going to play solo uh, off and on during the coming week, maybe a little bit more than that. We'll see. I usually take my time with these games. I like to enjoy them. Uh, I'm in no rush. And this is uh, the Battle of Brandywine, and I'm going to be playing the full scenario, the main scenario, I should say, which is outlined here in the Brandywine Battles book. Yeah. And we'll go over some of the rules in here. Um, enough to say that I will be using all of the rules for this scenario, except the last one, which is the intelligence variant, which probably works best when you got two players, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, we will skip that one. So if you're familiar with the game system in this particular scenario, I'm going to leave this one out. This is my first go with this system, although I have played some practice games, and I'm going to leave this section out. Uh, we'll be using the details on Brandywine Creek itself, of course. It does affect movement, combat, and leadership. Hopefully we'll see some of that in the battle. Uh, the specifics of the commanders, what happens, and so on and so forth if they're captured. Uh, special units and commanders well over here are detailed like Ferguson's rifles, little notes. We'll be using all this. Maxwell's detachment, I'll point them out in a minute. Uh, and also this section here, series rule variations. Uh, primarily movement considerations. This is a big part of this scenario, and I'm going to kind of go into that with you because it really will have an impact on the strategies I adopt for both sides. Uh, yeah. And so on and so forth. Stacking rules, if there's any specials, we'll be using all these. And of course, here's the details of the game length and the victory conditions. There's three levels of victory. There's decisive, uh, there's substantial, and there is a marginal victory for both sides. Uh, I'll kind of cover this because this will be important for those strategies, as I mentioned. And let's take a look at the map and give you an idea of what it looks like and what the forces are on the table at the moment. As you can see here, we've got the Patriots. They're basically two wings. They're divided up into two wings. There is the dark blue striped uh, counters over here on the left. This is Sullivan's wing. And on the right, you can see these guys here. They have a kind of a, a grayish light blue stripe on the tops of their counters. That is, I believe, Green's uh, wing. Yes, it is. And he has not entered the battlefield at the moment. He will be entering the battlefield. Uh, from over here, I think it's up here at E. Entry point E. You can see it up there in blue. I'm not going to show all these little details for you. Uh, but he'll be showing up in turn three, I believe, with some additional troops along that same route there. Uh, this is a pike, by the way. Uh, and these brown uh, paths are roads. And important distinction. To keep that in mind. Quicker movement, strategic movement. That'll be useful for that purpose. But, uh, yeah. So basically, we got two wings for the Patriots. Over here, again, is Sullivan. And over here is Green's wing. Now, Sullivan is pretty much the big cheese here. And I'll explain that in a second. Uh, well, I'll put it, re explain it right now. He has the ability to release the entire army from its bivouac area. It's an encampment. Now, if you look closely, and maybe it's hard to see. I could have probably outlined this with some black... Uh, pen, but there is actually a perimeter here, and it goes all the way up here and up into the uh, eastern side of the map, all the way up to this point up here, and basically this is the bivouac area, the encampment for the Patriots, and where you see them located now on the map is pretty much where they're stuck, uh, at least till turn four. Uh, they can't move beyond that point. For instance, I don't know if you can see this. Let me try and zoom in. There you can kind of see it right here. Go 
goes all the way down here. And as far west as uh, the river itself, they can't cross this. So this area all in here, this is where they are stuck. That's their encampment. Uh, again, they're expecting the British to be attacking uh, from this direction, from the west of the Brandywine. They're not expecting how to be coming up in the north and coming from this direction, which he will be doing in turns 7 and 8, I believe. Well, turns 6 and 7, I should say. He'll be arriving up here in the north, uh, right up along that road there and coming on. And we'll show that in a second. But uh, the Americans are pretty much stuck here. Now, by turn four, there is an option for the Americans, Sullivan, in fact, to release the entire army, both wings, uh, to come out of the encampment and basically be able to move anywhere they want on the map. Uh, the only penalty to that is that by releasing them early on turn four or five, I'm going to give up some victory points to the British, and I believe it is two victory points in turn four, one victory point if I release them in turn five. Now, by turn six, everything is automatically released. So if I wait until we can really, really confirm that Howe is on his way coming from the north, uh, if we can wait that long, then I don't have to give up any victory points, and I can just move my units anywhere I want, out of the encampment area, across the, the river, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I'm thinking I might be releasing them early, and I'll go into that when I go into the strategy. Uh, there's also an option here for Green's Force to be released earlier, earlier uh, to be able to cross the Brandywine Creek. He can't leave the encampment, not until turn four at the earliest, and that would be Sullivan doing that. But he can actually cross this river earlier in the game, turn one, two, and three, I believe. And again, I would be giving up victory points to the British to do so, but it would allow me uh, to cross the river with some of Green's troops, uh, basically to reinforce these guys, which are, as you can see, are already across the river. That's, this is Maxwell's detachment, and he's, about the, he's the only force that's actually to the west of the Brandywine at the moment. Uh, Maxwell himself is located here behind some breastworks atop this hill. He does have some artillery with him. Uh, yeah, he also has four of these units, which are deployed by me. Anywhere within this zone, you can kind of make it out. It's kind of like the encampment that I just showed you up there. But this is a separate deployment area, and it's specifically for Maxwell to deploy his troops w within. And I do have these four additional units that I can deploy anywhere in here. In addition, Maxwell himself cannot leave this area. What he can do, he can go across the Brandywine if he's attacked in close combat or shooting by the British. So if I want, I can pull these units back and get them across the Brandywine Creek. But once I do that, they can't come back and I'm subject to all the rules restrictions of staying within the perimeters of this encampment until the army is released in turn six, or in my case, turn four, because I think I'm going to attempt that. But again, we'll get into that. So let's take a look at the British at this point. So here's the British. These are the initial troops that will be moving on to uh, the battlefield in the first turns of the game. Uh, we got these guys here, which are the second brigade. They're called the second brigade. And I'll get to them in a minute. Uh, but this is the force that will be coming on in turn one. Uh, Knipphausen himself will be coming on board. Of course, he's a German. And he's got a bunch of British regulars here, some artillery. And he's also got the Queen's Rangers, uh, some uh, Tories, if you will. Uh, Ferguson's rifles as well. This is a first fire marker to show that they haven't fired yet. They'll get a bonus for shooting first time they fire. Uh, they will be coming on in this position here, where it's marked A. All these guys. Uh, one thing I do have to do it before the game starts, I have to decide where the second brigade, as these guys are known, are going to come on. And where I want them to come on will dictate what turn they will come on. Now, if I want them to come on here with these guys, they'll come on in the first turn. Uh, if I want them to come on here at B, it's, it's written on the counters, they'll be coming on in the second turn. Okay? And finally, there's also the 3rd Brigade, 
which is up here. These guys have a little bit more choice in where the, when and where they can come on. Uh, they can come on at, at uh, B, they can come on at A, and they can come on at, where is it? Uh, D, which is way up there. I'm going to show you that. That's basically where Hao is coming on. So I have a choice of three spots where they can come on, and that will dictate the turn that they come on. Now, I want them to come on, I believe I decided here. Let me see. I marked them with a shattered. That means hex B on turn three. So this is where I want them to come on. And again, this is a decision I make before the battle begins. So the start of the battle, the third brigade, these guys here, will be coming on this location in turn three. So what I'll do is I'll put them on the turn three um, marker. And yeah, they'll come on on turn three and it'll be at this location. Another decision I have to make is for these guys, like I mentioned, and I do want these guys to come on B as well. And that means they're going to come on on turn two, and they'll be able to come on in here. And that includes these artillery guns, although this one is delayed an additional uh, turn, turn three. He'll come on in this spot. So that's where Grant and his second brigade will be coming on, right here. And so will this guy. And finally, coming back on here again, these guys come on automatically in turn uh, one from this location. In turn two, keep in mind, there, there's a substantial force of Germans uh, that will be coming on from this point as well. And I'm going to show you what that looks like because uh, there's a lot of reinforcements to be expected for both sides. And I'm going to show that here in a minute. And just like magic, there it is. And you can see the reinforcements and the turn of arrival for these guys. This, of course, is Howe's force coming in on turns 6 and 7. There's a lot of troops coming in. And there's some more troops coming in later on, all the way up to turn 9. And earlier than that, turn 2, I did mention the Germans were coming on at that A entry point. That's this stack as well as some artillery, British artillery. And turn three sees some more troops as well. Of course, here's green. And got some more Tories here, some loyalists, as well as some regulars that will also be coming on. And they come on on point A as well. So there's a lot of troops coming on at that A point. And that's good. That's where I want them to come on. And, of course, these guys right here. Now, just to show you, uh, these guys basically house flanking force I don't know if I could zoom in on that, but it's this point right here, the Forks Road. This is the point they will be entering on turn six and seven. And yeah, it's a pretty long road going up in that direction up there. And right here is the Birmingham Meeting House. That's got an objective point on it. I will show that in a second. But uh, yeah, so by the mid point of the battle, 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to start seeing uh, Howe's flanking force come on the board from the north along that road, that point. That is an important uh, objective in this game, or deployment point in this game. Now we're going to talk a little bit about strategy, and what I'm going to do for this battle. Uh, let's take a look at the British. First of all, we do know that Howe is coming up on this road. He's going to be coming on from this point. In fact, there's some Americans, some patriots that will also, earlier in the battle, be also withdrawing from this point. And it's basically horse and dragoons that are basically uh, spotting Howe's force. And they'll be falling back in this direction as well uh, before the British actually get here. There's that to note. But as far as objectives, to get a decisive win, the British need to do basically one thing. Well two things. And if you look way at the top here, we have uh, the town of Dillsworth, Dillsworthton. Right here, it's those little gray hexes. Up here, it's got a nice big red star. This is an important objective, that hex specifically. The British need to capture that. But not only that, they also need to capture this position right here. There's another red star. This is basically the road to Philadelphia. Those two points, if the British manage to occupy them, uh, regardless if enemy are adjacent, if they can occupy both of those hexes uh, at any point during the battle, 
at the end of the American turn, they will have won the battle decisively. And the only requirement is that the units occupying those hexes have to be British uh, regulars or lights. That's the only requirement. So if they can pull that off, they've got a decisive victory. And that's definitely what I am going to shoot for, particularly when Howe gets onto the board from the north, up along that road there. So, yeah, and basically, to facilitate that, and again, I'm looking at the strategy for the British at this point, to facilitate that, now historically, um, Knipphausen's a force here that were deploying from this direction. They were basically a holding force, a distraction, uh, convinced the Americans that this is where the main attack is coming. And that's pretty much what Washington was thinking, uh, to be honest with you. Um, and basically what I am going to do, I'm going to continue that, that whole idea. My whole main interest here is to get troops across at these two positions as quickly as possible, take up a nice position along this ridge line if I can with my guns, uh, but not commit to any attacks. I want to kind of hold off on any aggressive attacks, although I do want to drive Maxwell back if that's possible. I want to get him back out of here and back across that creek. And I think we'll be able to do that. We shall see. This is a pretty decent sized force to, to accomplish that task. And in the next turn, I do have a substantial force of Germans coming up behind me. Uh, however, the one thing I do want to do down here is I want to withhold, I want to keep a nice strong reserve of troops. And maybe that will be the Germans that arrive over here. Or maybe that will be the, the third brigade that, come, that are coming on here in turn three. Um, the point to that is that I want to hold them back. I want to keep threatening the enemy, let them know that we're here, and that, yeah, this might be the main attack, but by the time Howe arrives, and as soon as he arrives in turn seven, I want these guys to commit to an assault. And I want them to hit, and I want them to hit hard, because one of the objectives of the Americans is right here. Proctor's Battery. That's the location of it. It's some earthworks. Uh... There's Proctor's battery. And this is a position that the Americans have to control. They have to keep the British out of here uh, to earn a decisive victory. This is the American victory condition. Uh, if they can do that, as well as the Birmingham, Birmingham Meeting House, and I'll show that in a second, uh, they can win decisively at the end of the battle. Uh, it's not instant. If they hold on to this in the Birmingham Meeting House with no British in that hex, uh, the Americans will get a decisive win. So this is an important location for the Americans. And for the British, I want to take that position. By doing so, I will deny the Americans a decisive victory. And that's what this force is going to be doing down here, especially the by turn 7 when I'm going to really commit to an attack. He's not going to be able to pull troops away from the river because uh, I'm making this attack. So how, hopefully, will be in a good position to move on to the two objectives at the top, as I mentioned. So that's what's going on down here. And if it just so happens we do get pretty successful and we do take this position, and I'm speaking for the British here, uh, if it's feasible, we'll move on down the road and we'll take the, that objective up there, the one going to Philadelphia, if Howe can't do it. So yeah, that's pretty much my plan for the British. Pretty straightforward. Uh, we'll see how well Howe does when he gets on the board. Now, there's one other thing to point out, and that's over here at the Birmingham Meeting House. Let me zoom in on that a little bit. You can't really see it too well, but that's the way it goes. It's located right here. And this is an objective uh, for both sides. Now, a lot like Proctor's position here, over there, uh, this is the same kind of situation. For the Americans to get a decisive win, they have to keep the British not only out of Proctor's uh, works down here, but also the Birmingham Meeting House. If they can do that, if they can keep the British out of these two hexes by the end of the game, which is 12 turns, they will have a decisive victory. That is how the Americans get a decisive victory. Now, they do have a second option for getting a decisive victory, and that is simply to cause... Uh, 15 strength points of damage or captures on uh, enemy, the British, uh, 
while uh, maintaining a twice as many by having twice as have having caused twice as many more than the British did, that kind of thing. And that may or may not be difficult to achieve. I don't know, but it is a second way for them to get a decisive victory. But I'm looking at the Birmingham House, Birmingham Meeting House, and Proctor's position here. If we can hold on to them at the end of the game, uh, the end of the battle, they'll have won decisively. And yeah, so for the Americans, their plan to go for that decisive victory. Now again, I'm playing this somewhat historical. Um, I am going to attempt to release Sullivan and the entire army on turn four. By doing so, I'll be giving up, I believe, two victory points, but it will release the entire army on turn four. And basically, I'll be able to move out of this bivouac area. I can move across the, the, the river. And the main focus of this is to get to Birmingham Meeting House. I really want to secure that and keep uh, the British from taking it. It's, it's extremely risky. Uh, well, I wouldn't know that the, the British are so strong over here, but then I would see them. So, And we do think this is the main attack. And historically, Washington wasn't really sure. He had his patrols out to the north, you know, trying to find out. Are they, are they trying to flank us again? And by turn four... Pretty much what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump the gun rather than waiting like Washington did. And I'm going to send my troops off immediately and try and get into the Birmingham Hill and the Birmingham Meeting House, set up a good defense, get into some of these farms and fields, the fence lines, meet the British as they're coming on, really slow them down. It's going to be tough. Uh, it's going it, to pretty much it's going to fall on Sullivan's wing himself his forces to do that. You'll probably see a very thin line, a defensive line running along this direction by Sullivan, uh, just to try and keep the army line from being penetrated. Uh, it's not going to be much. He's going to have a lot of troops down here up on this hill and at Birmingham Meeting House and to meet Howe head on. <laughs> we'll see how that works, but it's going to be fun. So yeah, I'm going to do that. And... Of course, I don't know what the British are up to. And the British will be, by the time Howe gets on, they're going to be pushing hard here. Uh, I'm not going to predict what's going to happen, but we're just going to have to wait and see. So that's the British strategy. That's their plan. And that's the American strategy and the American plan. They're basically going to jump the gun uh, and release the army sooner on turn four and get my troops up here as quickly as possible and meet Howe head on. And, yeah, we'll see how successful that is. The British are really going to be coming on strong. And all or nothing, right? And, of course, there's two other ways to win. Like I mentioned, there's the, there's the marginal victory and substantial victory. Substantial victory is winning through this table here. This is the army morale. This is basically where if uh, one side does enough things to demoralize the enemy army and they reach zero... Uh, the enemy will be forced to withdraw, and there will be a, a substantial victory for that side. And we keep track of this with these markers here. In this case, both armies start at level 20, which is high morale. As certain things happen, this will drop. And so on and so forth. If you reach zero, you're demoralized, you lose, the opponent gets a substantial victory. So there's, this is the second way to win, the second level of victory. And the smallest level of victory is the marginal victory, and it's basically through points. Uh, it's basically point values. Proctor's battery is worth victory points, and it all depends when it is captured. It will be worth so many points. I'll keep track of that if the British capture it. Uh, the sooner they capture it, the more victory points they'll get. The same applies for releasing uh, the wings for the Patriots. Uh, if I release green early and allow him to cross the Brandywine Creek, like I mentioned earlier, uh, I'll be giving up victory points to, for that purpose. And releasing uh, the entire army under Sullivan uh, earlier than turn six will also give away victory points to the British. So there is that. And of course, taking out enemy units, captures and all that are worth victory points. And we'll be keeping track of that as we play the game. But those are the other ways to win, and we're going to focus on the decisive victory for both sides. Risky business, folks. Can Sullivan get to Birmingham and hold off Howe's arrival? 
He doesn't know exactly when he's coming. Well, actually, the player does, me. But, you know, he doesn't know that. Turn seven. And we'll see what happens. So, okay, folks, I'm going to get into this. And like I said before, as we get into some special case rules that pop up as we play, I'll mention them, I'll point them out, and show you what's going on. For instance, uh, uh, Lafayette is in this battle. He's located up there at the headquarters for Washington, which is right here, marked with that big flag there, the Stars and Stripes. It's also worth victory points if it's captured. And Lafayette is in that stack. Lafayette always has to remain with Washington. He can't leave Washington's location. So wherever Washington goes, Lafayette goes. Now, the one special rule for Lafayette is that he can be used to join a close combat and modify that combat in the favor of the Patriots. But he can only do it once. And as soon as the player does that with Lafayette, Lafayette's removed from the battle. So he's a one-shot deal there. Otherwise, he sticks with Washington. It's, it, there's a lot of special rules like that that apply, and I'll mention them with them when they do come up. Uh, so there you go, folks. This is the start. We're all ready to go, and we're going to get into turn one and see how far we get along. Okay, folks, leave comments as usual, and uh, let's get into this.